I'm Margarita Noyes, and this is Lesson 7 in the series Spiritual Therapy for Spiritual Diseases, which is a course taught by Father Paolo Ricardo. It's not my material. I'm just repeating his uh, Portuguese course in, in, into English. It's been a long time since I recorded Lesson 6. The students who were doing this project finished their visit and went back to Brazil. So, uh, this project of translating Father Paulo's course took a back burner. But, right now, I am dealing with some feelings and emotions that make me want Father Paolo's teaching. So, I am back into it. This lesson was translated probably two months ago by Pedro, and I am finally recording it for you. The reason I am interested in this for myself right now is that Lesson 6 about Pornea spoke about the fact that love wants to express itself and sex is one way that we can show love. But the same energy of love can go toward other people and toward God and toward other things. And right now, I am looking for a way to channel the love in my heart into a good life as a single person, kind of like the priests who are celibate. It said in Lesson 6, a priest is not a man who does not love. He is a man who loves without possessing. And I want to develop the love in my heart. The question we consider is, how can we heal? How can we cure the spiritual disease of pornea or luxuria? First, Father Paolo reminds us that although sex is related to the body, the spiritual disease is spiritual. Sex is not so much about a physical act for human beings as it is about a spiritual reality, the spiritual reality of love. We have to keep in mind the spiritual dimension and begin there if we want to heal the outward manifestation of lust. The Lord Jesus perceived this clearly when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard it said that you must not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust upon her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, the Lord Jesus shows us that the sin is actually internal. You don't even have to commit the act to have committed the sin of adultery. It's not about doing something. It's about something going wrong inside of us. The sin of lust, before it matures into action, adultery, has already been committed many times within. 
So we need to look at the root, which is in the heart. It's not enough to stop having sex physically. A person is sick in his innermost self long before he ever commits the act and even if he manages to abstain from the act. So we have to address the internal sickness. How are we to fight the sin of lust? Well, we saw in our last lecture that for a human being to be satisfied sexually and to be fulfilled in his romantic or sexual relationship, he must have love. He must have a relationship. It's not like the animals who can be fulfilled just with the act. You have to have a spiritual communion in order to be fulfilled in your romantic relationships as a human being. Remember, the primary sexual organ in a human being is in the brain, not in the genitals. The Holy Fathers would say that the sexual act or lust begins with fantas fantasia, fantasia, fantasy in English. And fantasy is a faculty of the mind. The mind. Let's try to understand what the sin of lust is consists of. God has created an order. We are made of soul and body. And besides that, there is the Holy Spirit, which can fill our hearts. So what does a healed person look like? Well, a healed person is somebody who's um, soul is ruled by God and whose body is ruled by their soul. That's the order. God, soul, body. The body does not rule. And the soul does not rule. God rules. God rules the soul and the soul rules the body. That's a healed person. There is a hierarchy. God, soul, body. How does the devil tempt us with lust? What is his goal? Well, he wants to turn the order upside down. He wants the body to rule over the soul. And the soul to take authority and disregard God. So it's exactly upside down, body, ruling soul, which tries to rule over God himself and the Holy Spirit. So that inversion of order is what the disease consists of, and that is what we have to combat. That is what we have to heal. We have to restore the order that God intends for a healthy human being. So first we have to understand the disease. How does the body come to rule over the soul? How does the devil bring this about? The method is through fantasy. Fantasy is the faculty of the soul which comes in contact with the body. So we have the soul and we have the body. And then the overlap is in the area of fantasy. Fantasy is the faculty of the soul which connects with the body. But this is all very abstract. Father Paolo tried to communicate it with a concrete example. He said, close your eyes 
and try to imagine a horse. What do you see? Is the horse a male or a female? What color is it? Is it standing? Is it walking? Is it eating? What is it doing right now? Try to hear the sound of the horse's breathing. Try to feel the warmth of the horse's body and its fur. How does the horse smell? How does the place that you're in smell? You can open your eyes now. Were you able to imagine all of this? If so, it's because your body has experienced it. You have, at some point in time, seen a horse. If you could feel the warmth, it's because you have felt the warmth with your hand, with your body. If you could imagine, if you could imagine the smell, it's because you have smelled it in the past. If you saw it in your mind's eye, it's because the image has come in through your eyes earlier at some time in your past. The body is what connects with the world and all the input goes in through the senses and is stored in the mind. Your fantasy, your imagination, draws upon data that is stored in the body, in the mind. So you were able to imagine, fantasize a horse because your body has images and memories of it. So the fantasy is in touch with the body. One proof of this that Father Paolo brought up is that someone who has never seen the naked body of someone of the opposite sex can't imagine it. There is a woman in Brazil who was an artist in the many centuries ago. And at that time, young ladies never saw the naked body of a man, never until marriage. And this artist was not married. So she tried to do a sculpture of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and his body looked like the body of a woman. Uh, just took away the breasts, that's all. She couldn't imagine the body of a man. If you have not seen something, you cannot imagine it. We can only imagine what the body has already experienced. So, we see that fantasy, imagination, is connected directly to the body. It has access to the body. And the body has access to the imagination. So, how can the body rule over the soul? It is through the fantasy, through imagination, because that is the point of contact. The soul is supposed to rule over the body. If the body is going to rule over the soul, the point of contact is the fantasy. And the way for the devil to achieve this sickness is by feeding the fantasy, by strengthening the fantasy, and at the same time, starving the will. So when the devil wants to achieve this inversion, what he has to do is strengthen the fantasy. Feed the fantasy with the wrong stuff. Incite the fantasy. And once the fantasy is incited, strengthens, strengthened, it takes over 
our inner world. It takes over the soul. And before you know it, the body is ruling over the soul through the fantasy. That's why the Holy Fathers understood that in order to cure this disease, you have to weaken the fantasy. You have to fast your fantasy. Imagine two young men. One goes to the gym and the other stays home and plays video games. If they got to a fight, who would win? The one who went to the gym because he had strengthened his body. The one who sits and plays video games would be weak. Well, it's the same way for the will and the fantasy. If you exercise your will to do what you know is right and what God says, and you're exercising it all the time, it will become strong. Whereas um, on the other side with fantasy, if you strengthen that, it will become strong. Um, fantasy is responsible for creating erotic dreams based on what you've seen and taken in through your senses. So if you feed it with pornographic images or violence or bad movies, whatever, you're feeding the fantasy to become uh, strong against the godly will. What is happening in these days with the fantasy versus the will? Well, these days, it's not okay for parents to discipline their children and make them strengthen their will. These days, um, adults, people, say it's not possible for young people to abstain from sex. Just give them condoms. Teach them birth control. If they want to party We'll give them a party. We'll set up dances at the school and uh, activities at the school so they can have a party and they can drink and they can dance with boys and girls together. It is not reasonable to expect them to be sexually abstinent or pure, so we will provide them the means to experience uh, sex as teenagers. Or maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's parents in the home and their child is watching TV or playing video games. The parent should say, turn off the TV, turn off the computer, go outside, play some sports. It's a beautiful day. Or go take care of the lawn or go do some chores or do some homework. Or play, practice playing the piano. The parents should say that and make the child exercise his will. But these days, parents allow children to watch TV, video games, and to never exercise their will to only feed their fantasy. So we have a situation where the fantasy is strong and the will is weak. Who is going to win in a fight like that? The body is going to get on top of the soul and win the fight. Here's a, a little piece of advice from the homeschool world for parents. One way we limit our kids from doing the things that aren't good for them and help them develop their will is we make them pay for everything. For example, if they want to play a video game for one hour, they have to pay for that with practice of the piano for one hour. If they want to watch a movie on TV, they have to do four hours of chores, something like that. Another thing we do in homeschooling is we keep 
out of the house completely things that we don't want our children to do. So in my home school and in our house, we never had a TV. We did not have one in the house. So my children grew up completely without TV. Also, we had no video games. We did not own video games. We did have some educational software, but the children had to earn the right to use the computer. So they would have to practice the piano in order to get the right to play the educational games on the computer. So that was one way that we addressed this problem. But Father Paolo points out that it is not just children who have this problem. We as adults are feeding our fantasy with soap operas, bad movies, romantic movies, violent movies, sexual movies, um, bad books, magazines, pornography. And at the same time, not exercising our own wills. And these days, young people are incapable of avoiding sexual sin. And Father Paolo says he believes that they are incapable. They cannot abstain because they have fed their fantasy so much and starved their will so much. A deadly sin does not happen quickly. It does not happen overnight. It does not come like a bolt of lightning out of a clear blue sky. A deadly sin develops over time. Small sin after small sin after small sin committed within yourself is like the clouds developing before a terrible storm. And then, after the clouds develop, pow, the lightning strikes. Deadly sin is like a strike of lightning after a long buildup of threatening clouds. A man or a woman does not commit adultery without a long period of internal sin and a long period of feeding the fantasy and starving the will. All deadly sins are that way. Think of a person who falls off a cliff. They would not fall off the cliff unless they were right at the edge. If they were a hundred yards back, they could not fall over the cliff immediately. They would have to take a hundred steps toward the cliff before they could fall off. Deadly sins require us to take many steps toward the edge before we fall off the cliff. You do not stumble into sexual sin unless you have been standing close to it for a long time. Feeding the fantasy with imaginations of doing the sin and starving the will that would have taken you back from the edge. To heal us of our spiritual disease of having our body in control of our soul, we have to practice something called fasting of the fantasy. So what is fasting of the fantasy? You know, fasting of food is to either not eat for a period of time or restrict what we eat. For example, I will not have sweets or I will not have alcohol or I will not eat any meat for a period of time. It's exercising a will to restrict my pleasures. What is fasting of the fantasy? Does it mean no magazines, no soap operas, no movies? Well, 
it's possible that these things would not be a sin. But if you are in the grip of sexual sin, then you might need to fast from these things. Thou shalt not commit adultery, says Jesus. But I say to you, if you look on a woman to lust, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. That is the reality. We have to kill this voracious appetite we have for um, fantasy about sin and strengthen our willpower. Self-denial, not watching it, strengthens your willpower. How many young people are not capable of stopping watching internet pornography? They can't stop. In some cases, they watch it without even feeling guilty. Uh, or sometimes they say to themselves, I'm going to check my email. And then they go to the other site first. It's impressive how we lie to ourselves. Oh, nothing will happen. I'll just look at the home page of this site. And before you know it, you're in the site. One sin leads to another. And before you know it, you have committed sin. And this is mainly men. Pornography is a male sin. But we have a female sin that is feeding the fantasy. And that is, Father Paolo says, chat, chat rooms. You go into the chat room and you start talking about your interests, your hobbies. But pretty soon, the chat goes to, what is your sexual orientation? What is your sexual preference? And before you know it, your fantasy is engaged and you are sinning in your heart. Chat leads to sexual sin for women. Sexual sin that happens in your fantasy is not located in the real world. If you want to be healed of sexual sin, you need to fix your feet in the ground of reality. This is another way to weaken the fantasy. Fix yourself in the ground of reality. People who are in love are usually in love with someone who does not exist. They look at the young man or the young woman and they think, oh, I've found the one. He is different from every other man. She's the only one I've ever met who dot, dot, dot. Most of the things you see in your beloved at first aren't really there. The individual has never had these characteristics and never will. When we go to a party or a dance and we want to meet someone, we dress up, we put on makeup, earrings, uh, fix our hair, beautiful clothing so that we can attract. We are putting our best foot forward. And the man too, he fixes his hair, puts on some gel, a little bit of cologne, shaves, good clothing. He wants to look attractive. And when the two people meet, that's what they see. They see a false image that is attractive. And their imagination supplies the rest. But thankfully, the illusion doesn't last very long. In about a week, the illusion which was as big as the Twin Towers, has come crashing down, says Father Paolo. In sexual seduction, fantasy plays a large part. But fantasy leads us into an unreal world. 
with people who don't really exist. We have to be strong and courageous. A strong man, a valorous woman, to resist and refuse the attraction of the fantastic world and keep ourselves grounded in reality if we want to avoid sexual sin. We need to be realistic. We, we are alone. You are alone. I am alone. The fantasy of a soul partner, the fantasy of a person who can come into my solitude and make it go away is not a reality. We need to face the reality that we are alone in our nature as people. We are alone. And not just momentarily, we are fundamentally alone. And we need to be brave enough to admit it, to face it, and ultimately to embrace it. St. Augustine says in the Confessions, O Lord, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee. The rest that we long to find is not in relationships of this world. It's not in the body. It's not in the physical world. We can get some consolation which prepares us for the eternal life, eternal rest. But the definitive rest will come when we are together with God in heaven. And we have to be brave enough on earth to face the fact of our solitude. Our sexual problem comes from the pain of our solitude. We try to make the pain go away through relationships, sexual relationships, romantic relationships. We try obsessively to get rid of the pain of our solitude. But our solitude is a fact of life on earth. We will not get rid of the pain of it through physical relationships or emotional relationships on earth. So if you meet a girl and you date her and have sex with her, and then you realize this isn't fully satisfying, what do you say to yourself? Most people say, this is the wrong girl. It's the wrong relationship. I don't want to marry this girl. She's not satisfying. I need to look for the next one. I need to look for another one that can satisfy me and take away this empty spot within myself. That's what most people say. Basically, they look for the next one and the next and the next every time they find that their relationship isn't satisfying them. But sometimes you meet a person who says, she does not satisfy me because she is not God. I can only be satisfied in God. She wasn't meant to satisfy me. I need to find my satisfaction in God. So which is it? Wrong girl or wrong pursuit? Wrong process. If you keep seeking your satisfaction in a relationship with a woman or a man, you will keep frustrating yourself and disappointing yourself. There is no satisfaction to be found in romantic relationships. 
that is a deep satisfaction. That deep satisfaction comes with union to God, not person to person. We must be brave to face this. If you are married and you realize that your marriage is not able to fill your heart, know this, there's nothing wrong with your marriage. Marriage is not expected to fill your heart. No man or woman can fill that emptiness. So what is marriage? So what is marriage? Marriage is companionship in your solitude. Your solitude and your partner's solitude keeping each other company. It's a companion on the road as each of you deals with the pain of the rocks under your feet. It's companionship while you walk the solitary road. So we can look at the solitude as a terrible, horrible problem to be fixed or through the eyes of faith, we can look at the solitude as a gift from God, part of his good plan for human nature. Actually, that's what it is. Solitude is a gift because it's in our solitude that we meet with God and with other people. Once Father Paolo was ministering to a woman, she was a nun. She lived in a community, and she had cancer. She was dying. And during the visit, Father Paolo talked mainly about his own life and problems. He didn't talk about her and her problems. He just shared his own heart and his own life and his problems. And at the end of the visit, the woman looked at him with tears in her eyes, and she thanked him for ministering to her. And she said a, a phrase that stuck with him. She said, it's been a long time since I met with a person. But Father Paolo said, she's surrounded by people every day. There's only real meeting when solitude meets solitude. Father Paolo says, young people and especially rascals, uh, bad, bad kids, can't meet anymore because they aren't willing to face their own solitude. They meet superficially. Hey dude, what's happening, what's happening, hey dude. But they don't really meet. And when they get home, they just want to go to sleep. They don't want to face their own solitude. But if you are not brave enough to face your solitude, you will never find real companionship, real friendship. Meeting happens when I, knowing my solitude, open my heart and show a treasure that's inside. I don't expect to totally satisfy the other person, uh, but just to offer a little bit of comfort along their pain-filled way. If, if you try to be everything to somebody, you're just going to frustrate yourself and uh, frustrate them as well. First, because you can't do it, and second, because they can't receive it. They can't accept it. So when you get married and you think, my partner will be everything to me, you're mistaken. You need to get real. Put your feet in the ground of reality. Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a wonderful Catholic writer, uh, he had one son who was a priest. He wrote to his other son, whose name was Christopher. He wrote that Western literature has done a great evil to people 
because uh, from the Middle Ages onward, the troubadours sang about women as though they were goddesses or as though they were a guiding light for men. But women are not that, uh, says Tolkien to his son. Women are just our companions in the sinking ship. He is saying that our ship sank with original sin and all of us in it. And right now, we are just drifting in a sea hoping that God will save us. And a woman can be our companion as we are trying to stay afloat on a troubled sea. We have to help each other, but not fix each other totally. That's not what husbands and wives are for. Our wives are our companions to help me get through the sea and to save my soul and my children's soul. But my wife is not there to satisfy my heart. Only God can do that. If you require that from your partner, um, you'll drown. Your partner cannot save you. You have to be brave to accept that. The monks of the past understood this very well, and they can be our teachers. We don't need to be monks, but we do need to be realistic about the human heart. The more we fill it up with created things, creatures, the worse it is, the more we harm ourselves. Father Paolo's advice to married or dating people, forgive your partner for not being able to satisfy you fully. Walk together and don't try to fulfill each other completely. It is this illusion that we can find satisfaction in a person that leads us to sin sexually over and over again with a new boyfriend, new girlfriend every time. We keep thinking to ourselves, this time it's going to work. This time I found the right one. But that is a phantasmagoric world that you're hoping in. It is not reality. You need to put your feet in the ground of reality. You are demanding of creatures what they cannot give. Only God can give it. Look at the real world. It's true, although not always pleasant. Jesus said the truth will set you free. But it is hard. It's hard to face solitude. Father Paolo teaches this to his seminarians, that they need to face their solitude, especially their Sunday night solitude. After all, the families go home after church on Sunday, and the pastor goes home to his empty, solitary rec rectory home to eat cold food that he has to microwave all by himself. The temptation for seminarians is to stay busy outside the home, to be at other people's houses or out doing something until late at night. So he just comes in and goes straight to sleep to not face his solitude because it's too terribly painful. It's tempting to become a parasite on families. It's not a bad thing for priests to um, become friends with families, to spend time with husbands, wives, and children. But it is a problem when the priest um, is drawing, it is a problem when the priest cannot face his own life of solitude. Celibates like that are not good for the community. Priests need to embrace their solitude. They need to face it so that they can shed light on someone else's solitude, especially the solitude of, of married people. If Father Paolo was not doing that, he wouldn't be able to bring this lesson to you and me.
he wouldn't know it. And this lesson actually has saved many marriages. Prince Charming coming in on a white horse, the damsel in distress, the beautiful princess. These are illusions. They're ghosts. You should stop creating ghosts to haunt yourself. Stop demanding from life what it can't give. Face reality. Courage to face solitude is the courage to face reality. So, summary. Two things are basic. One, the faculty which is most connected to sexual sin is fantasy. We need to fast, diet, or abstain from feeding the fantasy and making it too strong. We fast in the realm of fantasy because our fantasy is too strong already. We need to strengthen our will to obey God and weaken our fantasy. Starve it. Fantasy leads us to sexual sin because it leads us to give control to the body over the soul. The soul needs to be in charge of the body, not the body in charge of the soul. Starve your fantasy and your will will be able to keep the soul on top. Fantasy is a faculty of the soul. It's imagination, sort of. But it's not memory. It's the creative part of the soul. It's not bad. We mainly want to weaken it if we don't have a strong will to do what is right. We must abstain from pornographies, pornography and movies with sexual content, from racy chat from anything that inflames our fantasy, even romance novels that inflame the fantasy that there is a man or a woman who will meet all my needs and give me satisfaction. It's not going to happen. And when you see a attractive person of the opposite sex, take authority over your mind with your will and stick to reality. Fantasy creates the illusion that we can be satisfied with creation instead of with God. That is not true. We need God to satisfy us. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. Solitude is the simple translation of Augustine's idea. The ancient monks understood this. The very word monk means solitary man. The, the solitary man knows he can only find his rest in God. If we could become aware of this, a good part of our problem would be solved. But don't think that understanding these pieces of information will cure you. You have to weaken your fantasy. You have to abstain from feeding it. You have to curb the fantasy. Also, you know that we are alone. You must embrace it and look for God. Most people will agree with this teaching in their heads, but the challenge is to get it to your heart. The difference between theoretical knowledge and actual knowledge is that you need to live it, practice it, and experience it for it to be um, actual. Last night, I was driving home from a meeting, and I was feeling very lonely and very afraid, and I didn't want to be alone. As you know, I'm going through a separation from my husband and 
I didn't like being so alone. But I remembered this teaching, which I was already preparing to record. And so I turned my mind around and began to thank God for my solitude in the car while driving and asking him to meet with me. That's my little baby step toward taking the knowledge from my head and putting it in my heart, trying to find God when I feel alone. Solitude is something that is part of our life and it is the place where we find God. This takes time and hard work because we insist on believing in the illusion that there exists some great guy or girl out there that we can find or something like that. People want the fantasy. They don't want the reality. But we were created to fit into this real world. This is the world we have to make work for us. We can only wait and hope that God will come and help us. So that's the end of this teaching. Thank you.